イザック・ニュートン。The Dawn of Classical Physics。The historical, historical turning point in the development of the physics, the dawn of the classical physics, belongs almost exclusively to one man, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton invented the mathematics required to do physics, the calculus. He developed the laws of motions and the theory of the gravity. He developed an understanding of the heat, light, and motion. He was a spectacular figure and absolutely the most important. Single individual in this story, and today I'd like to take the some time first looking a little bit at his life and then trying to make some sense of the early idea that Isaac Newton s generated about motions and how we understand the principle of the physics that are that are so essential in our, our understanding of the world. Isaac Newton was born in 1643. This is、uh, the same year as,、uh, as I mentioned the last time that Galileo died. It's about 100 years after the Copernic s published his work and,、uh, on the theory that the sun is at the center of the solar system. And he is born in England on a small farm. They were not a rich family, but not completely poverty stricken either. His father died before he was born and he was. His mother struggled very early on his life. She remarried and she moved away, leaving him to be raised by other family members and then go off to the boarding school.、Um, little Isaac did okay in the school. He was not a superstar right away, but he fairly quickly began to develop.、Hmm. And uh, uh, by the time he was in what we now call his high school years, now he was really shining, and it was obvious to a lot of people that this guy really n e e d to be、uh, intellectually developed more than the, what you what you, you expect for an ordinary farmer in England in that era. He was sent off to the Trinity College in Cambridge. Now, you might think of the Cambridge, Cambridge as a great center of the intellect and the academia in that era, but no, it was still something and backwater. It was really mean, it was really meant as a, a training ground for clergy, and there was not a lot of advice,、uh, I, 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 there was not a lot of active or up to date academic work going on there. Newton found it and、uh, he studied philosophy and natural philosophy, meaning the pre scientific ideas that were being developed.、Mm. Mm. And uh, uh, he studied mathematics, was very interested in it, and discovered that the texts were insufficient, so he had to go to the library and read the original Euclid from the Greeks. Ultimately, he began to sit and、uh, develop his own mathematics. He was a, a lonely character, not very likable, didn't have very many friends throughout his entire life. He was a very curious character, he never married, and、uh, it's, it's a shame when the, this sort of the iconic and essential human being was also just not a very guy, just not a very nice guy. I find it. I find it fascinating to learn about him and trying to understand this character. When he was a kid, he grew very interested in the natural world. He, build, he would build、uh, toys, he built、uh, sundials, and he built、um, flew kites. He built the little model windmills, anything that he had to do with mathematics and、uh, understanding the world. He was fascinated and.、Uh, He was fascinated, and as, as the story goes by, as he grew older in life, he could tell what time of day it was by looking at the shadow cast by building because his experiment as a kid. Wow. And there,、uh, at some point, early in his life, in, this, in his high school era, he was given a blank notebook. And not, not that many, not, not, now, that, that may not seem like a big deal today, but in the 600s, having a blank notebook was a fairly precious thing. He put chapter heading at the top of the pages. Early on, the pages were completely blank. 
he was just thinking about he would he would like to run the ball and he chopped the heading war remarkable and um, it was uh, as 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 though this this man had a direct insight into the future development of the classical physics for the next 300 years astronomy optics heat fluid flow and he realized that uh, he, he realized right away just by thinking about what it was uh, that was interesting him what the the deep and fundamental physics programs were that human beings would be tackling using his methodology methodologies methodologies for many centuries to come mm. astronomy optics heat fluid flow and he and he, he realized that right away just by thinking about what it was that was interesting him, what was the deep and fundamental physics problem that were human beings would be tackling using his methodologies for, for many centuries to come. In 1665, um, he was nearly done with his Trinity, Trinity College work and he turned, returned back to the farm because of the outbreak of the plague. Now, you have to realize that in this era, when the plague comes to England, people didn't really know how to deal with it. There was no antibiotics. Uh, what they did know, even in the 1600s, was that they didn't want a bunch of young people all cramped together in, in small classrooms. Uh, so, um, so, because as, so as soon as one of them had the plague, everybody in the university would be gone. Hmm. That they basically just called off the school for two years, and Isaac Newton went back to the farm. Mm. He was a lousy farmer. He had no interest. It was quickly in recognized to just let this guy do his own thing. Uh, and there was this this surely teenager uh, sitting on the farm for almost two years, thinking and writing. He did experiments. Yes. And uh, uh, he he did he did optics experiment he did mechanics experiment and physical experiment and uh, it was in this short period of time in his life that his intellect really blossomed uh, the vast fraction of his ultimate physics creativity was uh, formed in the, in this period of time he came back to the he he. Uh, he, 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 he came back to the, these ideas, he developed them further later in his life, but uh, um, uh, uh, this, peri this period was really where he discovered or invented the calculus, the laws, laws of the gravity, the laws of the mechanics that we will be talking about, uh, and uh, the ideas that about how things move, equation of, equation of motions, all of this was being developed sitting on the farm. Wow. It, it is in this period when people tell story probably apocryphal about the upper falling in some various versions uh, the upper falls and thinks about universal theory of the gravity and uh, in, in other versions it falls on his head and he, he has this moment of the enlightenment <laughs> it is not at all clear whether any of these things happened of course He was just thinking about gravity during this period of time. He was interested in Kepler's laws, which he knew about it. Remember, Kepler had discovered or described um, in detail how the planets moved in the solar system. These three mathematical laws. These laws are very accurate, far more accurate than any other had worked out in the, in the previous year. Uh, but not understood at the fundamental level. Why did the planets move in the el ellipse? How could we make sense of this? So, uh, so Newton was thinking about that. He was also thinking about light. Hmm. Um, he made some brilliant dis discoveries about prisms and the colors of the light, of course. He was thinking about fluid flow, heat, and all of this together, all of this stuff together. He discovered quicker that mathematics he had available to him were inadequate. So, 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 so using a, a, a geometry, using algebra, these are the very powerful tools, uh, uh, but they are limited. 
if you are want to understand the planet going around the sun, you realize that the, as it moves, it gets closer or farther, and it, if, if it gets closer, it speeds up or slows down the, 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 the change in the position. The affecting the rate of change in its position is very complicated little math puzzle. And what Newton discovered was that if the he uh, uh, um, and the, what Newton discovered was that if he wanted to understand changing the quantities, he needed to develop a whole new formalism, a new way of thinking about uh, mechanics. Mm. I'm sorry, a new way of thinking of mathematics, not mechanics. New way of thinking of mathematics. Uh, this is calculus. Ha ha ha. This is calculus. So, uh, differen differentiate and uh, integral. Yeah. Differential and integral, of course. And, uh, um, um, you know, uh, it it's impossible not to call Isaac Newton a genius. He is certainly worse. But I hesitate a little bit to use, the, use that word because the word genius is a separator. I, I, Isaac Newton, I, I, the, the word genius is a separator. Isaac Newton is a genius, so I can't understand what he was thinking about. Um, um, uh, I would argue that we all can understand what Isaac Newton was thinking about. Parts of this genius was that ultimately the idea that, 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 that were in the fact very access, accessible and very simple. What we th might not be able to do is uh, recreate that sort of the intense period of one and a half years where you do it all at once. That's really quite un 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 unprecedented. Yes. So we can understand what he did and how he did, of course. That what we can't do it is uh, doing everything in <laughs> two and a half year. Wow. Oh, one and a half year. One and a half years. Wow. That's spectacular. That's genius. Uh, these ideas were developed and then he sat on them. They weren't published until 22 years later. And the world, the world is very lucky that a fellow named Harry, famous for Harry's comet, came to the visit, visit Newton's later in his life and convinced him to publish this. Harry was interested in the comet, and there was a conversation in which Harry asked Newton some astronomical question. Newton just knew the answer, and Harry was amazed that somebody knew the answer to these deep and difficult mathematical and physical questions. It, it, it turned out, uh, Newton said, Oh, I worked, that, I, I worked that out when I was a young man 20 years ago. And, uh, and so Harry, was, Harry convinced him, uh, him to publish. And so Newton basically shifted gears at that later point in his life. He sat down for another absurdly intense, focused one and a half years period, and he wrote a book called Principia which is a surely uh, the greatest single physics sex or book uh, ever crafted. It got everything in there. It has his old ideas. It has uh, the development of those ideas. It has many ideas about gravity and about optics. And in particular, in the Principia, Isaac Newton wrote down in a very clear way his way, his idea about the scientific method itself. So, so, so you have to realize that the scientific method that this method of discovering physical truths that we've been talking about was still under the, under the development. Hmm. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, and people were arguing about thinking about uh, how it is that you decide the nature of the world around us. And Isaac Newton's scientific method, as I printed in the Principia, is still today the model we teach to the school children about how you should go about learning about uh, about how the world works. So this is Isaac Newton. He's a curious character, very uh, very ego egoist egotistical and very generous. He was prone to elastic bottles where he would turn on his own friends. Um, he he. 
he he mistreated uh, some of his uh, uh, contemporaries. He, uh, Fook is one of the the characters whom he uh, despised, and he tried actively to harm Fook's career. Wow. Mm. Uh, so, so similar similar story with Leibniz, who developed the calculus in Germany independently. But later, Isaac Newton wanted to establish that he had done it first, even though he hadn't really published it yet. So, there are great, uh, delightful stories. I would absolutely encourage you in that one of again this in the person where they're reading some bio- biographies about Isaac Newtons are uh, delightful and a, a lot of fun. Maybe moving just a little bit uh, beyond the scope of this lecture series. It is really fascinating to learn about the era in which he lived and uh, ma- manners in which he developed these ideas. Mm. I'd like to now focus on these ideas and uh, uh, I'd like to talk about in particular the laws of motion. That Isaac Newton was um, developing. Yes. Um, so this is going to be a basis for much of the classical physics. It forms the core idea on which we're going to be building this course. We are going to spend quite a, a few lectures talking about Newton's laws of motion. They look spectacularly simple. They are all in sense. In in certain sense, very very simple ideas, but we really need to focus on them and think about the, uh, them uh, because there are some slippy aspects. Um, a part of the brilliance of Isaac Newton's work was his ability to really clearly cl- clearly articulate what he meant by the words that uh, that that he was using and the ideas that he was uh, developing. Um, we are going to be talking about the three laws of motions, number one, two, and three, and uh, then his universal law of gravity. Today, we just to start with the, the first two of those laws and try to have a sense of where they came from. Uh, Newton's first law is now known as, a, as a, the law of inertia. And indeed, it's really a restatement, a reformulation of what Galileo had been discovering. This is a law that I phrase as if I there, there is no outside force acting on an object, then if it starts at rest, and it will remain at rest forever. If it is moving, it will remain in motion, the same motion, with constant velocity, meaning at the same speed in the same direction forever. That's uh, Newton's articulation of the Galileo's ideas, and he's not stealing the idea, he's really clarifying it, and he's very open and honest about uh, attributing the ideas that he developed from other people. There is this great quote from Isaac Newton in the rare moment of the modesty, this man said, If I have, if I have seen father, it's by the standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, it's a lovely statement that is often quoted, but I believe that Newton wrote this statement in the in the letter either to or about Hook, who was a very short man, and I think it was I he he was mocking him and implying that I I've stood on their many great shoulders, on but many not yours. <laughs> Such a bad guy, Isaac Newton. That's too bad. Uh, but it, it's a, it's a lovely quote anyway. Yeah. Um, really an important part of science is to con- uh, to recognize what's come before. Um, as you weaving this tapestry as we've been think- talking about, we-, we must remember that all ideas are still there with any experiment that has done. You need to understand how what you are doing fits in with these old ideas. So let me talk about let me talk about a little bit about Newton's first law, these laws of inertia, in the, in a slightly different way. Galileo was thinking about frames of the reference, and so was Isaac Newton. So a frame of reference refers to your choice of your laboratory, 
I'm standing here in this room and my frame of the reference is, is centered on the me because physicists are egoist so the world revolves around me. So what, what that really means is that I, I can really make a measurement and talk about physics with respect to the points. And this is the origin and so you might be 2 meters in front of the me or you might be 2 meters in front of but 1 meter to the left. Mm. And um, so I can start to develop this reference frame in which I describe positions and then velocities and their accelerations. And uh, this reference phrase is my choice. And you have your own reference phrase. You can make your reference measurements in your reference frame. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, and so, 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 um, so you can make your measurements in your reference frame, and we will disagree about the certain things. Yes, we will. Um, so we will disagree about your position. Your position in your reference frame is the origin, and so we will disagree with the number, the, 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 the specification, but when we start talking about other things, we will agree. Mm. So if a uh, so, so so if a little marble is rolling across the table, um, you and I will both argue that it is moving at two meters per second. We will both agree on that. However, there might be another reference frame somewhere where somebody would disagree even with that. Um, the picture of somebody who is on the little rolling trolley cart or boat or any any steady moving object. Uh, uh, suppose that, 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 that they are moving parallel to that marble, they are moving steadily, and uh, the marble is moving steadily. Mm. Uh, try to shift into the, their reference frame for a moment. Visualize how the marble would look if you are moving along parallel to, uh, parallel to it. You look over and there is a marble next to you and then you look over again and the marble is still next to you. Every time you look, the marble is exactly the same place. Uh, as far as you are concerned, that marble is at rest and it's uh, remaining at rest. Mm. So now all of a sudden we realize that the difference, uh, di difference frame is such a... Uh, uh, um, such as uh, that moving the reference frame are perfectly legitimate um, um, there is nothing wrong there is nothing wrong uh, with making measurements from that vantage point and uh, um, we will disagree now not just on the mar position of the marble but the velocity of the marble so so what, what Galileo realized and what Neil was able to articulate even more carefully was that yes Different observer in different reference frame may disagree on the detail of the description, but we all agree on this law of nature. So if I watch this marble and they do this some experiment, recreating Galileo's experiments with lowering marbles in which I I say I say the law of physics is that the the, the object in motion remains in motion, and the object at rest remains at rest as long as there is no net force on it. Mm. Everybody agree, agrees, even the person who is in the moving reference frame agrees with that laws of nature. In this particular example, they saw an object at rest uh, remaining at rest while I saw an object in the motion remaining in the motion. But we, we, uh, we agree on the fundamental law. Uh, this is a huge idea. Why so? This is a huge idea uh, that, 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 that the some things are relative, but other things are absolute, is a part of the principle of relativity. Relativity doesn't say everything is relative. It says that the law of physics are going to be the same in all of these, these reference points. Now, this is one of the uh, lead discoveries or lead de developments of the Galileo's work that Newton did. There was something fundamental that was missing from Galileo's work and this was one of the Isaac Newton's great insights the one of the topics that we will spend a lot of effort trying to make sense of it. 
What is in that cause the change in the motion of the object?、Mm. So we just said if there is no force, then the object will remain at rest. But what do you mean to do? What do you need to do to make it move? Well, I- I've already used contemporary words and I've clued you in the Newton's big idea. It's a force. It's a force. Applying force. I, 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 applying force, a push or a pull, is what would change the sense state of motion of the object. object. If you don't apply the force, if you don't apply the force, then you, you don't change the state of motion. Yes. I'm sorry, I skipped the sentences.、Um, so, so, what is it that causes the change in the, the motion of the object? object? We just said if there is no force, there is no, there is an object will remain at rest. But what do you need to do to make it move? Well, I've already used contemporary words and I've clued you in a, on the Newton's big idea. It's force, applying force, a push or a pull is what would change the state of motion of an object. If you don't apply force, then you don't change the state of motion. Newton develops this law. It's the second law of motion and it's、uh, abbreviated by the formula F equals MA. One of the most famous formulas in all of physics, although we avoid a lot of math in this course, I just can't resist talking about F equals MA. It's a d- delightful little relationship which connects F as a force on the one side with M times A, the mass is a- M. And acceleration is a, which we've been talking about. So, this idea is a, is a tougher than it looks. It looks like a simple little formula. You have to two of the numbers and you plug them in, a, in, in, in and you have a, the third one. If you are thinking, if you are, ta- if,、um, if you are talking about traditional mathematical physics course, you would probably spend the upwards of the months focusing on the equation and trying to understand. How it's used, where it is used, the most easily, what all of these terms、uh, mean, and solving mass puzzles and mass problems involving these terms.、Mm.